Бутик Политик. Авторская программа Кирилла Задова, посвященная текущим мировым проблемам. Бутик Политик. Предвзятый обзор, субъективные комментарии и искренние оценки Кирилла Задова. С понедельника по четверг с 4 до 5. Бутик Политик. Сказал, как обрезал. Приветствую, друзья, с вами Кирилл Задов, это Бутик Политик. Сегодня 31 марта, год 2022, четверг, последний рабочий день для этой программы на этой неделе. Как я и обещал, нам удалось организовать интервью с профессором Ифраевым Инбаром, который воспрезиден... является президентом, возглавляет институт... Иерусалимский институт стратегии и безопасности. Сразу после небольшой э, рекламной паузы мы вернемся и начнем этот разговор. А, друзья, я напоминаю, что РУИС и радио является абсолютно коммерческой диастанцией, не получает никакого иностранного финансирования. Ваш покорный слуга высказывает в этой программе свое собственное мнение, которое часто может не совпадать с мнением редакции, и даже в большинстве случаев так и происходит, кстати. И опять же, никакого иностранного финансирования ваш покорный слуга не получает для всех, кто думает по-другому. Бутик Политик. Сказал, как обрезал. It's my it's honor for me to introduce professor Fryman Bar, uh, president of Jerusalem Institute of Strategy and Security. Professor, how are you? Welcome on board. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm fine. Mm. And that's your first trip to United States after pandemic, or you've been already here before, like during last no, two years? No, actually, uh, it's. Uh, I've not been in the United States for more than two years. I was uh, closed at home because of the pandemic, and uh, uh, I like America, so it's be good to be here for a while before I go home back. Pleasure to see you here, right. Uh, that's kind of pleasant part of our conversation. I would like to ask you first, that Putin obsession with NATO and with threat that, according to Putin, NATO represents for Russia, is it justified in your opinion? Listen, I, I don't want to give uh, any marks to anybody, but I can understand the Russian position. Uh, and I think uh, it is understandable in light of uh, the historic sensitivities of the Russians and in light of the fact that uh, Russia was attacked from the West uh, many times in its history, that it wants uh, some kind of margins of uh, security uh, on its uh, Western border. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, other countries uh, want as well. The Americans have a Monroe Doctrine in which they don't want uh, you know, foreign powers to be in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, this is of also understandable. Uh, countries are fearful of each other. Uh, we are not yet uh, in a paradise. <laughs> and uh, countries are uh, taking care of their security. Only some Europeans think that they are already In the zone of peace, uh, you know, the right. The messianic era. Right, right, the end of history. Uh, so if it's understandable from political realism point of view, why, how could you explain uh, refuse of American administration to discuss security concerns of Russia in converse, in the dialogue, in the in talk, in a, in the talks later, uh, before, before the war started? Unfortunately, I cannot understand. I cannot understand. I cannot explain uh, the American position. I think it's a certain hubris on part of America after the end of the Cold War. And also some kind of missionary drive to bring democracy everywhere. And so they expanded NATO and the EU toward uh, the East. And uh, I've always believed that this was a strategic mistake. And uh, ignoring, uh, you know, fears by a strong country such as Russia. As far as uh, war and uh, campaign, military campaign is developing, what do you think, because uh, all Western media present that as a failure of planning, as a failure of military campaign, is a uh, uh, big mistake on the Putin side. What do you think from military point of view as uh, like a military assessment? How's campaign going? Is it uh, open... It can, we can see, all of us can see that uh, the mistakes were made on the planning stage. It's already 36 days of the war, no major city is taken by Russian, uh, by Russian force, and it's uh, like uh, very hard. A lot of casualties from uh, uh, civilians, a lot of casualties of uh, military personnel. How would you assess first 36 days of war? <coughs> 
first of all, I don't know the Russian plans. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not privy to this type of intelligence, so I don't know what the real, the real plan was. In any case, uh, it was not a, a, a blitzkrieg, quite obviously, and uh, it seems that uh, Putin was, uh, to some extent, misinformed about the ability of his own uh, military. And he underestimated the capabilities of the Russian military uh, to do a job uh, quickly. Probably it would, have, it would have been looked better, and this is what most people expected, that the Russian will uh, be able to advance uh, quickly and uh, take over um, some important cities, including uh, the capital, and uh, stay put and uh, bargain with, uh, with the West uh, over uh, what's going to happen. Uh, it seems that... Um, Russian military has some difficulties in advancing. It also had to recur to uh, a lot of firepower, uh, which of course it uh, creates a very bad publicity for for Russia because we see a lot of Russian uh, uh, Ukrainian civilian uh, being killed. We see tremendous damage to the civilian infrastructure in uh, in Ukraine. And uh, this is not a good uh, public relations campaign for Russia, and uh, it does not instill fear among its neighbors, if this was uh, the Russian uh, plan. So in your assessment, you would say rather it's uh, like a previous generation warfare that we see right now, instead of expected like third and fourth generation of warfare. So everybody was expecting something like Crimea operation. Instead, it's just regular artillery strikes, um, big massive of troops going to cities, uh, besieged cities. But if we compare that to American company against uh, Islamic State in Syria, for example, it was a very long, very long siege of Raqqa and carpet bombardment of Raqqa with huge amount of civilian casualties. And nobody was saying anything. How could we reconcile? How can we reconcile the things? The, the American press uh, is... Uh... <laughs> obviously uh, more benevolent toward uh, what the Americans were doing uh, against the Islamic uh, State. Um, still, I don't know how if it's a uh, fourth generation, fifth generation, all those terms are, uh, uh, I don't like them. War is the same phenomenon over the years. And uh, war is use of force in order to coerce uh, your enemy to agree to your terms. And actually what we see already in my view, is partially a Russian victory. Uh, Ukraine wanted uh, to be part of NATO, wanted to be part of uh, the European Union, and uh, they announced already that they are not going to join NATO. Uh, they announced that uh, they are going uh, to adopt a, a neutral position in their foreign policy between the West and, and Russia. So I think uh, if this was a goal, of Putin, uh, he achieved it. Uh, wars are messy, that's true. And, uh, you know, it is a messy war. And, uh, of course, uh, knowing how Russians think, uh, <coughs> if civilians are killed, so be it. You know, that's, that's war. And uh, they want uh, surrender. And uh, I think uh, uh, the Ukrainians made uh, a mistake in not surrendering earlier. <laughs> In the, I mean, in, in terms of civilian casualties and damage, huge damage to infrastructure, of course. But uh, neutrality is one thing. But in those peace talks that were ending Tuesday in Istanbul, Ukraine proposed certain security guarantees, which include uh, guarantees from Great Britain, France, Germany, Turkey, and Israel. The, out of those countries, only Israel is not a NATO member. And the base of those security guarantees should be the same as Article 5th of NATO agreement. So meaning those countries that are going to provide those security guarantees, if Russia agree to that, they're going to uh, place certain military infrastructure in Ukrainian territory as a preventive measure against potential Russian aggression in the future. So what exactly going to be neutral status if all 
major NATO members are going to protect Ukraine and give Ukraine security guarantees. So it doesn't look to you that Ukraine goes on the other way to NATO, creating parallel NATO military infrastructure, military alliance that's going to be duplicated to NATO. I, I want to remind you that uh, Ukraine had already international guarantees to their territorial integrity. But not like on fifth, uh, yeah, but not like not, fifth article of NATO agreement. It was not like no, uh, collective defense. Countries like the uh, United States and the UK, they pledged that they are responsible for the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Uh, and of course, uh, they violated their pledge. <laughs> Crimea <laughs> was taken, the Donbass republics were established uh, at the expense of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And uh, so, and nothing came out of those uh, international guarantees. I think uh, one main lesson uh, from my point of view is that you should not rely on international guarantees. It's Habesian world, self-help, right? Of yourself. And uh, the approach by the Ukrainians, maybe it's, you know, uh, uh, saving face, but uh, in practical terms, international guarantees are worthless. We were thinking that it's only for Israel true, but it looks like it's true for everyone. So... Habesian political realism is still alive today. It's a self-help. Nobody yeah. going to come to risk you. But... Um, Czechoslovakia had guarantees. <laughs> you know, look back at history. Poland, Poland had guarantees, Not right. Only if, uh, you know, the countries that are guarantors are really taking uh, it seriously. It's not necessarily the case. Right. So my next question is that uh, let's uh, switch to little west from Ukraine. So now... Do you think Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, do they have right now legitimate concern as they perceive Putin threat to them that he may invade their territory? Do you think it's legitimate? <laughs> of course, they, they, they are afraid. They should be afraid uh, that Russia might invade those countries that were part of uh, you know their uh, area of influence uh, during the uh, Cold War. At the same time, I think they have somewhat less uh, reason to fear uh, taking uh, uh, into consideration the performance of the Russian army. So uh, it goes both ways. Uh, in any way, uh, if uh, Poland or the Baltic states uh, will hire me as an advisor, I would tell them, prepare for defense. Uh, don't make mistakes uh, by poking uh, the eye of your uh, big uh, neighbor uh, you know you live next to a bear uh, which can be aggressive you should be careful i think ukraine was not careful enough i'm watching great britain and poland behavior and as always i find it very provocative uh the question is very purely hypothetical but uh, can poland or great britain make certain movement that provoke Russia to, like, to sh start shelling Poland, for example. In your opinion right now, is the situation right now. They will even ask United States, you, you remember the story, to take uh, MiG uh, fighters, jet fighters, to Rammstein, Germany base, and then to transfer them to Ukraine for fight. And uh, only I think only Russian uh, statement that any NATO airdrome, uh, airfield that going to be used for Ukrainian air, jets for bombing Russian troops would be considered like NATO joined the war. There was a statement from Ministry of Defense of Russia that stopped it. Pentagon said right away, stop, no, we're not going to transfer any jets. But in the future, Great Britain, as in history sometimes happened, uh, can be more assertive in what they do. So can it, like can that war bring Third World War? That's, what, that's a question, basically. We should not uh, exaggerate the weight of UK, uh, you know, in, in this uh, situation. And basically, uh, Washington will call the shots. And Washington made it quite clear. Uh, I'm not sure it was wise to make it clear. So they have no intention of fighting. And they have no intention of uh, uh, being drawn into a war uh, in the Ukraine uh, uh, situation. Uh, which actually gave Putin a free hand to do what he wants and also gave him the time needed. He doesn't fear uh, American intervention. 
unless there will be a big change in America. But uh, so far, uh, President Biden uh, is insistent that he is not going to be drawn militarily into the conflict. Professor, but I have to remind you that in 1999, Bill Clinton also didn't want to bomb Serbia. But it's Tony Blair coming to the United States and his speech in Congress forced him to take an action. Everything is possible. But uh, uh, I don't see the Brits, you know, really caring so much about Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, they are... Uh, More concerned, yeah, after, more, more concerned with Brexit week. and Johnson b- b- Bush Brexit party. Brexit right? and right. other things. Right. So uh, their plate is full. I don't think they are looking for an adventure in Eastern Europe. I hope so too. Uh, let's thank, thank you very much for your Ukrainian uh, uh, Ukrainian view. I just wanted to switch to Israeli topic. I just have to remind our listener that Professor Infraim Inbar with us today on air, uh, president of Jerusalem Institute Strategy of Strategy and Security. Professor, that last wave of uh, terrorist activities for last week in Israel, we saw 11 killed people and a couple more attacks, a lot of wounded people, and uh, mostly perpetrators were Israeli Arabs. What does it tell you about near future perspective? Where it's going to? <laughs> You know, we live with terror for 100 years. There's nothing new about it. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure that your characterization of the events of the terrorist uh, attacks in Israel, the recent uh, terrorist activities, can be called a wave. It's an accumulation of uh, several uh, uh, terrorist activities. Part of them were perpetrated by Israeli Arabs. Uh, and uh, part of them were perpetrated by uh, Arabs in, uh, in, of the Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria. Uh, so I, I'll, I would be careful in, in calling it a wave at this stage. Maybe, uh, you know, in the near future we'll be able to characterize it a step. And uh, there are two separate responses uh, required for, uh, for dealing with this type of terrorists. Uh, in the West Bank, uh, of course, uh, we need uh, uh, to be more active, but we should remember that uh, probably uh, only 1% of the planned terrorist attacks against Israel from the West Bank are successful due to the work of the Israeli intelligence services. And uh, I think that uh, no Israeli has the illusion that we have a foolproof defense against terrorist attacks. The Israeli Arabs is a different story. Uh, they are uh, citizens of the state of Israel, and our security services are limited in their ability to sur- for surveillance, in their ability uh, to uh, arrest them. You know, it's a democratic country, if we have to show to the Uh, judicial systems that uh, there is a reasonable uh, <clears throat> suspicion in order to uh, have preventive, uh, you know, uh, jailing uh, and, uh, and surveillance. So but can difficult. you, but can you, I'm sorry for interruption, but can you declare emergency in this case, then all civilian liberties can be suppressed for, for a certain amount of time? You know, calling emergency would be a victory for the terrorists. Hmm. I think that we should uh, be able, and I think Israel was able, to uh, routinize this type of conflict. We, we live with it. And I think that this is the right response. We should not be hysterical. Um, after all, terrorism is, can, is of limited damage. Today was uh, an attack, uh, you know, uh, using a uh, not even a knife. So uh, not always they have weapons. They, they cause limited damage to Israel. And uh, Israelis understand that if they want to have a state in this tough neighborhood, there is a price to pay. And unfortunately, it's in blood. But we can live with, uh, with terrorism. Terrorism is not a strategic threat. 
איראן איזה סטרטיג'יק סטרט, הנוקליאר בום איזה סטרטיג'יק סטרט, but not terrorism. No. Then I want to... Terrorism is a weapon of the weak. We should never forget that. Then, then. In retrospective, last year in May, I think, there was a huge deal of Arab revolts. Like thousands and thousands of Arabs in place that uh, are Arab places, they were marching, Accra, Yaffa, they were marching, They some of them had weapons, and they were screaming things that uh, made me feel like I'm in 1948, not in 2021. I, I say it's a kind of exaggeration, of course, because I'm not living in Israel. I'm visiting sometimes, thanks God, but I'm not living there. But I spoke, I recently visited Israel, and I spoke to people, and they were saying that those uh, revolts, those march, uh, marches, they are, they feel really threatened by that. And keeping in mind double loyalty of any Arab citizen of Israel, because he has probably relatives beyond the defensive shield, defensive, defensive wall, separation wall, and uh, those people are limited in their rights, of course, because they, for Israeli security, they cannot cross at will the border, they cannot come to their relatives. And the uh, number of Israeli Arabs now is, is more than two million people, right? If I, if I... Yeah, uh, around. And around the same in Yudav Shamron, around the same in Judea and Samaria, probably like that, maybe a little more, but we don't know, I don't know exact million. number. Half a million more. So it's a lot, it's a, if we add everything, we see that it's about 60 on the territory from Mediterranean to Jordan River. It's about 60-40 proportion. 60% Jews, 40% Arabs. And it's, it's a huge proportion. And if they coordinate what they're doing, they may present existential threat, don't you think? If they uh, wishes and they like, if they're not treated properly in their opinion, they can unite. I mean, Arabs of Israel and Arabs of Yehudah Shamron can unite because they're relatives. They represent the same clans. So there's not a big difference between them. You think it's not more important threat to Israeli security than Iran? No, I don't think that. Uh, although I uh, definitely do not uh, look down upon what happened in last May. It was... Uh, uh, of great concern, and Israel uh, should prepare for this scenario. I would like to point out that, uh, you know, the numbers you are saying are not, are not the problem. The problem is that 5% of those numbers could create tremendous damage to Israel. And we should concentrate on those 5% that are potentially very dangerous. And uh, I think that uh, Israel for years has neglected uh, to implement its sovereignty in areas that uh, Arabs live, uh, in the Negev, uh, in, in the Galil, and we should uh, have a much greater Israeli presence, be it by police, uh, be it by uh, uh, official of ministries and to be present there. And uh, this has to be done urgently uh, because uh, such kind of activities can disrupt military activities. If we have, you know, in case of war, we have to transfer uh, troops and equipment from the center of the country to, uh, to the frontier, uh, this is a huge problem and it will take time and effort in order to clear those obstacles. You mean those territories so, in Negev that Bedouins already uh, have uh, built like uh, villages, not lawful villages, like illegal illegal construction that they do. I just recently visited Negev, I was going to Miss Paramon and I saw a friend of mine showed me what they're doing for last years and nobody can, like there's no police. There is no military, nobody's intervened with them, and they have guns, by the way, also, and you know that, right? So it's it's a double, yeah. it's a twofold task. First, you have to reassess, uh, reassert Israeli sovereignty there in Negev, and second, you have to uh, take away the weapons they have. I think that we've seen uh, recently several operations to collect weapons in the Arab sector. I think this type of operation should be intensified. 
and to make sure that there is a rule of law, that Israel's law reaches every corner of the state. What about Judea and Shamron? What about you, Judea and Samaria? What do you think? What's your opinion? This is a different issue. Why? This is a different issue. Actually, our intelligence capabilities in Judea and Samaria are much better than the intelligence capabilities that we have among the Bedouins because of the constraints imposed upon us. upon those services by Israel being a democratic state and having to there are things that the Israeli securities can do easily in the West Bank but they can't do it in the Negev or in Arab villages. So the tactical move would be in Negev. We have to change the law. No, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. You can say you can declare it military closed territory and do whatever you need. I don't think that's easy and I don't think uh, we should punish uh, a large segment of the Arab population and we should try to find the, the needle in the haystack. This is the right approach. To counter terrorism you need intelligence. Right. And just massive military measures are, have proven in the past as being ineffective and in antagonizing the civilian society, civilian population, and we have no reason to antagonize them, particularly since most Arabs in Israel, by the way, also in the West Bank, are not actively participating in terrorist activities. Agree. But in March, in March there were a lot of people, a lot of people. It looks like huge, it's big crowds, big crowds. Big crowds, but if we are uh, uh, speaking about a population of two million people, we are talking about a few thousand, maybe 10,000, maybe 15,000, no more. So we have to keep you know, in mind the, the proportion. Right, that's true. And, uh, Don't panic, right, you're right, you're absolutely right. But that everything what you're saying right now is a short-term solution still. In a long-term solution, two and a half million Arabs of Yudava Shamron, Judea Samaria, present certain security threat. What do you think, in your opinion, what do you think should be done with that territories in the future? Like in uh, like next two, three, maybe five years. What's your, what's your approach to this? I think that, uh, unfortunately, there is no possibility to reach a political agreement with the Palestinian Authority. That is divided between you know, the PAs, Palestinian Authority and Hamas, and also we see no uh, mellowing of the traditional Palestinian position vis-à-vis Israel. So uh, unfortunately, the only uh, policy, viable policy, is to manage the conflict. We should try to uh, limit the bloodshedding on both sides, to limit the suffering on both sides, and uh, leaving uh, the future uh, to, uh, to the future. We, we don't know what will happen. Uh, generally, uh, we should realize that we live in an area that use of force is part and parcel of the rules of the game. It is popular. People like their leaders to, to use force. Uh, nobody disarms. This is the area we are living in and, uh, you know, <laughs> looking for solutions may be the wrong approach. So you are against annexation. Problem. You are against annexation, as I understand, and taking Judah, why Yehuda and Shamron. Why should I give them status uh, of Israeli citizen? In 20 years. Oh, in Turkey. I'm not totally against annexation when the uh, Trump plan was on the agenda. Um, I and my institute suggested uh, to annex part of the Judea Samaria according to three criteria. One, that is strategically important. We have to recognize not every hilltop is strategically important. And a second criteria is not, uh, to an area in which there are not too many Arabs in order not to burn us ourselves with what we call the democratic prop. Uh, problem and the third criteria that this area is within Israeli consensus. For example, 
חברון. בת חברון. מייבי חברון. But Jordan, I'm speaking particularly about the Jordan Valley and the area surrounding Jerusalem. So um, uh, we should not tear our society apart uh, if we can leave those difficult decisions for the future. Agreed. Uh, we will continue right after a short commercial break in a couple of two minutes, I think, three minutes, and we'll be back on air. Thank you very much, Professor. Бутик Политик сказал, как обрезал. Профессор, welcome back. Thank you very much for staying with us. I understand that you probably have jet lag still. A little bit. Uh, a little bit. Listen, uh, I want to switch a little bit to like a outer circle of Israeli security. Arab, whatever they call Arab Spring made... Uh, immediate like borders are more secure in my opinion like syria is no longer syria that we had uh egypt now after mursi was overthrown is more secure for israel it's a part of a bigger kind of sunni nato picture that trying to be built right now uh jordan is sometimes present issues but basically uh, everybody interested in uh security paradigm that was existing before uh that uh war that saudi arabia uh have with emirates against houthis in yemen what do you think about that is that present security threat for israel because the red seas makes it like very close war to israeli borders uh what should be done from israeli side maybe maybe to assist emirates and saudi arabia in this war because houthis are saying i was listening to what they saying recently again all that wars right now they even say that ukrainian wars Uh, Ukrainian war happened because of Jews. They they completely they very anti-Semitic and they very anti-Israeli, and they are Iranian proxy. Why we not get ourselves involved with this? Well, first of all, uh, it's important that uh, you recognize that uh, the Houthis are Iranian proxy, and uh, they are fighting uh, the wars of Iran against uh, the Iranian competitors in the region, which are Saudi Arabia. and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I think that uh, we are helping uh, those countries uh, under the table. Not everything is public. Um, moreover, I think that uh, we are part of the criticism launched at the Biden administration for delisting the Houthi from the terrorist uh, list organizations, which is a huge mistake and totally un- not understandable. Uh, I'm not sure that we should get uh, you know uh, more involved than uh, we are now. First of all, uh, we have to recognize that uh, they are at great distance. Uh, it's the southern tip of the Red Sea. Uh, we have uh, a naval presence and I think uh, there is also a naval war going on between Israel and Jordan and uh, I- Iran. Uh, in that area, but uh, getting involved uh, in the ground uh, fighting uh, in Yemen, I don't think it's something that Israel should do. Uh, let others do the job. Uh, we don't have to do everything. Uh, we have enough problems for our, ourselves. Don't you think it would be a great... It's responsibility to, to take care of the situation. Right. Don't you think... Uh... It would be very nice for region if United States would be more assertive in this matter and, uh, for example, provided more uh, guided missiles to Saudi Arabia and even probably participated in bombing campaign because Houthis are not friends of America either. Uh, I think that it would be very correct on the Americans to help uh, in terms of military equipment um, and uh, to save some of the unnecessary criticism of the Saudi regime. Uh, in order to help them fight this war. I think also the criticism against uh, President Assisi in Egypt is, uh, is not helpful. And uh, again, Israel uh, on the hill is trying to mute down some of this uh, criticism and uh, to make sure that the Egyptians are getting what they need uh, in their, with their, the promised military assistance uh, to Egypt. Uh, I can understand maybe the rationale of uh, 
the Americans to get out of the Middle East and to pivot to China, but uh, uh, behaving in such a way toward uh, oh. good allies is, uh, I would say, it irresponsible. It's negligence. And it looks like consecutive American admin- uh, democratic administrations of the, of the United States are behaving negligently to Middle East region. And I can even generalize and say, in my opinion, that Democrats are bad for Middle East. <laughs> it, you know, we, we had some good times with... Uh, with who? Uh, with Carter? Uh, uh, yeah. well, no, I'm talking about Clinton. Clinton, right. Who was yes. a good friend, uh, so, uh, which is more recent. So, uh, uh, but I, I'm certainly worried about the direction of the Democratic Party uh, nowadays. Uh, particularly is a growing influence uh, of what they call themselves the progressives. Uh, and um, uh, generally, I think that uh, the Democratic Party uh, thinks much less in strategic terms. Uh, to give you just a recent example, they cancelled their support for the East Med uh, pipeline <laughs> that was supposed to bring gas to Europe uh, because of green reasons. You know, I, I appreciate the the green concerns, but there is also uh, other uh, important... More pressing, concerns, pressing concerns, right. Could have, could have helped now Europe, you know, limiting its uh, uh, energy dependency upon the Russians. So this was, uh, again, uh, with no strategic foresight. And, uh, well, what can we do? Washington uh, yeah, misses the Kissingers and... Uh, True. Uh, the other uh, real politic, uh, you know... Uh, people that could have managed a, a much uh, better uh, foreign policy. That's absolutely true. Thank you very much, Professor. It's a big honor to have you with us on board. I hope next, uh, when you'll be in Israel, I will be able to connect and we will be able to discuss more pressing concerns later in, the, in during the year. And it would be a pleasure and honor for us. Professor Fryman Barr, President of Jerusalem Institute of Strategy and Security, thank you very much for your participation and Have a good luck. Have a safe flight back home. And uh, shalom, peace. Thank you very shalom. much. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of things to speak of because the Middle East is not changing. Right. Soon. And exactly. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Бутик Политик. Сказал, как обрезал.